everybody, and welcome to the Enterprise Dish. We are back for another, uh, what's going to be a good episode, especially if you, you like Windows 10 or some of the things that Windows 10 doesn't do. And uh, Ducks and Rick are not here today, but we are hanging out with Jeff. And Jeff, uh, what's going on? And say hello to everybody and introduce yourself. Hey, everybody. I'm Jeff. I'm with the Smart Deploy support team and uh, and newly recreated um, YouTube channel team. I was asked to start creating some YouTube videos for Smart Deploy to kind of bridge the gap between uh, you know some of these some of these problems where people are having with um, Windows 10 and then and, and doing deployments that aren't always related directly to the software you're using, but you know one of those things where you kind of you have to get a couple of hurdles with uh, Windows 10 before you can make sure that your deployment projects go smoothly. And so the idea was these videos would, would help with that. And so, and here I am. Yeah, and if you haven't figured it out by now, um, the, one of the reasons why we wanted to have Jeff here is because he knows a lot about deploying Windows 10. And thanks to Microsoft and all of your feedback that we get probably on a weekly basis about this show, is that most of you don't really like the two times a year update. Um, Jeff, are you hearing anything different that about these updates, but everything I've heard so far is that they're pretty much creating uh, a lot of havoc for just about anyone running Windows 10. Yes, it's uh, it's a tremendous pain, and the the best part of it is each each update seems to break in a different way, and um, and so yeah, a, a a majority of the problems that we see and customers having problems with deployments is a result of an in-place upgrade. And I think part of that might be because, um, you know, everyone uses Windows Update, and so you think, oh, there's this new creator's update, and you're just going to install it. But when really, it is a pretty major version update for Windows 10, and and it can cause a lot of issues. And yep. um, and Microsoft, uh, you, you know, a lot of people don't know that you're not supposed to do an in-place upgrade on a machine you tend to sysprep, but that's the way it is. Really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's and so we, that's we have, interesting. We have customers that, you know, right off the bat, hey, uh, my image was working perfectly, and now I have all these problems on, on post-deployment. And, you know, you tend to think something's wrong. This this deployment software doesn't work. What's wrong? Because uh, my, my image is working. All I did was install this update. And the first thing we always have to tell them is, well, you're, you're, you'll, you'll want to create a new VM <laughs> rather than throw yourself on the rocks to try and figure out what's breaking, because um, that's our job, right? We uh, we we've actually gone and we've every single update, we we've gone and uh, and tried to fill in the holes or fill in what's breaking, and so we can fix so people don't even see this issue. But there's always this period following an update that, you know, when and people we say we're working on this, but in the meantime, if you want sure. this, if you want to start deploying now, create a new VM and. A lot of people don't like hearing that because it is a pain. No, it really is. And not that this is adding more any more fuel to the fire that we need to. The machine that I am uh, recording this podcast on that we're, that's hosting this podcast updated to 1803 yesterday or two days ago. And yeah. it, it's a very delicate system because of how we, we run all this. And after we got to 1803, nothing on our audio settings were were intact. I had to go and essentially rebuild the audio infrastructure of all this. And when you're doing a podcast every day, I, you know, I just I come down here thinking, all right, I'm gonna hit the power button, turn the software on, everything's gonna be working. It ended up being about a 45 minute process until we could record. And, and when you have time sensitive things, it was just a huge pain in the butt. Right. Um, and that's one of the reasons we we tell people to treat treat these updates as a major version, you know, deployment project. You know, obviously. You don't want to just have people at random installing a uh, creative update. Uh, like I remember, I was working at home on my personal computer, and um, you know it was in the morning, and I have a, a lot of things I need to start getting mm -hmm. to work on. And then the little pop-up says, "Hey, Windows needs to restart to install some updates." So I thought, "Oh, that's fine." Click the update, and then I had to wait. I mean, I, I forget how long it was, but I had to sit there and wait because it was installing this major update, and so I was kind of offline on my system. It was a huge pain. So, yep. But that's why it's always a good idea to, you know, don't just update your VM, create a new VM with this new version, do your testing, due diligence, and then say, okay, we're ready to move to 1803 mm -hmm. in your deployment project. Yeah, and this is, it's a really big deal because a lot of people, 
if you're if you don't work at a large company, you're thinking, oh, what's the big deal? You got five, six machines. Um, but we have people who listen here who write in and say, hey, I've got tens of thousands of machines. And when you have to do that across that scale, and not to mention you're only getting at best roughly anymore 18 months unless you're running the long-term servicing channel, which you probably shouldn't be doing on the desktop or, or for the end user, that is. Um, mm -hmm. it, it's a serious it's a serious problem. Actually, one of the biggest complaints that comes in is, is, hey, I go to management to get funding to upgrade from Windows 7 to Windows 10. And then I have to have the conversation and tell them that, hey, it's actually going to be more maintenance overhead to go uh, upgrade cycles inside of 10 rather than just staying with Windows 7. It's a really hard conversation to have. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a tricky one. And being two times a year is... is uh, I'm sure everyone agrees is an, is annoying, right? And that's why, yeah. I, like I said, you treat it's not something you want to just be. Oh, the, the you know this version comes with this new ver, uh, this new little trick or whatever. Like let's mm -hmm. just update. It's never like that, right? <laughs> I had I, I used to use analogy that Windows is a lot like the dishwasher in your house, right? You don't really think about it. You just kind of have it there and you use it. And one guy wrote in and he said, actually, I think Windows is more like the electricity in your house. You just kind of need it to be there and work. You don't care if it's 120 volts or 240. You just want it to work. And he said, the problem with Windows 10 introducing is that sometimes it's just not working. And that's the underlying appliance that a lot of software runs on that people use to actually make money in their business. There's very few companies in the world who actually make money with Windows itself. A lot of it's software that's running on top of it. And so that becomes the big issue. Yeah, I like that analogy. That's good. It's like, you know, going to plug something in and, you know, your, your plug-in doesn't fit anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, a, that's <laughs> frustrating. A, exactly it. So I got a question for you here. Uh, what is your kind of thoughts and opinions on in-place upgrades versus system prep? You know, so let's just kind of walk through the world of updates here. 1803 just came out. You know, what is your kind of opinion and take on about how, how you know, somebody who's running 10,000 machines should be approaching these types of updates at this point? Well, I would say, you know, it's but evaluate if you really need the update and like it, what is this? Like you said, you're not making money off Windows 10. Is there, is this is there a feature that's going to make everyone's lives that much better m making the update? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, and if 10,000 machines. I like to, you know, it's it's hard to quantify how much how hard it's going to be to do a deployment project because if you have ten thousand machines but your image is relatively basic, maybe it's it's pretty easy to to make an image and test it. Yep, everything's great, and then you come up with a rollout plan and stages, and everything's fine. But there mm -hmm. are a lot of people who have, uh, you know, they have a, a lot of deltas between the, the the images they have for their departments or, or regions or whatever, or they have software that takes a long time to install. And we do run into some people like that it's not just as easy as spending the 30 minutes or whatever to install windows and updates and throw a few applications and capture your image and you're gone yeah so so sorry i feel like i digress here from the original question um oh it's you know, all good <laughs> yeah when, <laughs> all uh, good i would just you know a lot and a lot of people don't know this because it's not something you think about just avoid the in place upgrade at always and here's um uh a, i've had a handful of customers they, with the, when you think clean installation, we tell mm -hmm. them you need to we you need a clean installation of Windows 1803 or Windows 10 1803 if you're going to deploy it. And so they say, well, I did that and it's still not working. I'm still seeing the same behavior. And you know, after a few back and forth, we realize, oh, what you did was you, see, you had your old your old 1709 ISO and then you installed Windows and then immediately updated. Then you know that's still an in-place upgrade and it's not it's not what we mean by clean installation of windows 1803 and so it's it sounds it sounds like you think you're going to save yourself work I'll, I'll just in place upgrade but then you end up throwing yourself on the rocks trying to solve this problem because you know this little delta in sysprep um and yep. it's and I, I mentioned now it's different it seems to be different every time with uh with uh, with 1709, it was start menu tiles weren't appearing. Like stuff like the calculator was missing, and you couldn't get it from the store. And in some cases, mm -hmm. the store tile was missing, and so you couldn't re-download these apps. And uh, I mean, I won't get into it now, but we found out there were a couple registry keys and stuff that we could adjust during deployment so that Windows came out for the first time and it, it solved that. With 1803, it turned out to be the service called the clip svc.exe service. Hmm. Uh, 
which would hang and then give you a, a, a fatal error occurred at cis prep and then and dump you out, which, you know, when you read fatal error at cis prep, sound, that sounds pretty bad. Yeah. Well, um, it turned out to just be a timing issue. And so we rushed to, uh, we rushed to solve this here at smart deployment. We thought that we did, but it turned out older machines needed just a tiny bit more time to mm-hmm. another version to accommodate that problem. And, and, and so that's what I mean by it. It breaks in interesting and unpredictable ways, and so that's why don't don't do it. Just build new VM. Get a new ISO, new VM. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting because Microsoft keeps making this promise that these upgrades are going to become better. Uh, I think with eighteen oh three, they said, "Hey, we're now using AI to target machines, and we've got two hundred fifty million people rushing it or running it." Um, but regardless of what happens to the the scenario you just described. Everybody's going to be different. You might even, unless you're running a bone stock machine from HP that is the most basic of mach- uh, devices, then maybe you're yeah. okay. But that's that that's not a realistic thing. There's security protocols. You've got your own software on top of it. Um, mm. I, I would almost venture to guess that even inside of companies, each machine is significantly different. Like the accounting is going to be way different than marketing, and marketing is going to be way different than the CEO. And so you, there's just so many different dynamics in there that these updates are causing havoc, mostly. Mostly because they're trying to get people to do it twice a year. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I wonder if they'll, they'll ditch the, the twice a year, you know, because it's, it's fun to say spring and fall. And, mm-hmm. But I, I, I think that it would be good to go once a year, give everybody a break. I mean, unless it's some really great feature, but, you know, I don't know. Yeah, they've got some new, uh, some new leadership that was announced this spring, Terry Myers and exiting the company. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see if those new leaders, because, I mean, they've got the power now um, to, to say, hey, you know what, we're going to stop that. But it's going to be one of those things that's a little <laughs> bit of an, an egg on their face. It's like, okay, sure. that, that means they have to admit that twice a year wasn't really, really worth it. Right. Or maybe they didn't think it would be so impactful. But here we are. Yep. And I, I, <laughs> I'm still waiting for the person to come to me and say, you know what, twice a year updates has been the best thing ever. Uh, because it, it's yet to happen where it's somebody saying, hey, you know what? Our lives are easier now because instead of doing that ERP update, we got to do Windows. It, it's um, That's the biggest problem is you have to shift focus back to Windows rather than other software in your company. Mm-hmm. Like you said, you just want, it should just work. Great should. software should just work. <laughs> It'd be nice if it did, but here we are. Yeah. So let's talk about, you wrote, we always do show notes before these things, and you, you wrote in a really interesting one, re-imaging rights to deploy. You want to well, dive into this one a little bit? Because this is definitely something we've never talked about on this podcast before. Um, sure. Yeah, re-imaging rights is, um, this is, again, something a lot, like, like you said, if something's working right, you don't think about it, right? And so a lot of, a lot of system admins don't want to think about imaging. You buy your computers, they come with your Windows license, and you just want it to work. And so people, we have customers that... Um, they'll just jump into their imaging project without really, you know, they, they don't know that they need re-imaging rights. And so, uh, and then of course, if, if you've been working with Microsoft for a while or as long as I have, you kind yeah. of tend to roll your eyes when uh, licensing comes up because it's, it's, never, it's never been very simple and you kind of want to just, someone else deal with that, I don't care, throw money, leave me alone, I want to just make, <laughs> make the computers go for everybody. Yep. Um, but so it, technically, you need to have a volume license agreement to to reimage your machines. Even if you buy if you buy 500 HP laptops and they all have their they all came with Windows 10 Pro or Enterprise or whatever, and uh, but you want to you want to blow them away and put your corporate image, you still need volume license rights. And um, we we notice a lot of people's tones change when we tell them this little this little thing that a lot a lot of people don't know. They'll say. Well, I bought 500 machines. They came with Windows 10. I'm not going to buy a volume license agreement for 500 more computers. And we tell them, you don't. You only need to, uh, you know, to buy the minimum for a volume license agreement, and then you can, um, then you can use all those licenses. The mm-hmm. so you only need five, right? So you buy a volume license agreement. You do have to buy five licenses, but that's only, you know, like we're a few hundred dollars, and then you get your volume license key. Then you can image all 500 your HP laptops, and with the one key, you're not trying to juggle answer files or manual input keys using the keys from the sticker or hoping that Windows um, picks up the product key from the BIOS and to activate like OEM 
uh, licenses typically work. So yeah, that's that's the. That, that's the big thing with uh, volume li- re-imaging rights and volume licensing is, you know, don't don't be afraid to, don't think that you're going to have to spend a bunch of money to do a volume licensing project. And on the other side, know that it's, it's super easy. So don't try and cheat. You know, sometimes we run into people who um, who don't know. And so they're in the middle of their volume license project, or uh, sorry, re-imaging project. And, um, you know, they'll be like, my, my systems aren't activating. And then well, what key are you using? They're like, oh, I'm not using your product key. I'm just leaving it blank, and then uh, uh, Windows is supposed to activate automatically, and then we have to uh, break the news. Uh, well, you know, that's uh, technically not in compliance, and it might work, it might not. And um, and besides, you don't want to use OEM media anyway. Like, you don't, you don't want to take your HP Windows uh, installation and then image that to all the computers because it's going to have all the OEM stuff on it and right. all things like that. You always want to... Uh, avoid using that. Um, we actually did a webcast with uh, Microsoft last year with this, and um, it was a huge turnout because this is one of those things that a ton of people are confused about. And like I said, you just volume licensing, like, ah, I don't hmm. want to deal with this. But um, yeah, technically it is yep. required. You don't want to use OEM anyway, and it's not that expensive. Yeah, licensing is always one of those real finicky areas because if you have a, if you're trying to upgrade and you run into a problem, you can punch that into Google and find ten other people talking about it. But getting mm-hmm. people talking about licensing is a whole different thing. One, because Microsoft changes it frequently, which is always helpful. Yeah. Thank you, Microsoft, <laughs> for that. We, uh, we we say it with a smile. Um, two, there's actual <laughs> real ramifications if you're wrong, right? If, you, mm-hmm. if you're fudging it and Microsoft audits your licenses, which they can and will do, you can end up on the wrong side there. And uh, people don't want to be right. held liable for things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So... Yeah, don't don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and if you do, don't call us because we can't help. Well, uh, anyway. yeah, we always kind of we we do have um, uh, shoot, I'm blanking on his name. We do have a contact if if they if they're like, well, we don't know, like, what do we do? We kind of we like to help people. Call this guy. Yep, he'll set you up, and then you'll be on your way, and you can quit worrying about this. Yep, there's always somebody willing to help inside and outside of Microsoft. It's just trying to find people who are knowledgeable and. Uh, my only recommendation on the licensing stuff is when you have an issue, find somebody who knows what they're talking about. Don't don't take the forum advice that you found. Right. On, uh, yeah. uh, find yourself on page eight, reply number or whatever, like, this guy knows. <laughs> yeah, and it was posted in 2013. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, been there. So l- let's kind of transition here for a second. So let, let's talk about building a VM. Um, in a, in a large shop, that's going to be pretty commonplace, but let's talk like smaller shops might be a little bit nervous to do this. They think, ah, we're just going to run Windows Update. We're just going to go that way. Can you kind of walk through the process of building a VM and how you would approach it? Yeah. Um, I like to think as, like, if you think of as a VM as something that you can easily just trash when you're done with it, right? Like, don't think, like... How do I phrase that? Like, it's easy to oh, I put all, all this work in this VM to, to to you know to make my golden reference uh, VM to for imaging and something's wrong, and then you do all this work to try and try and try and figure out what's going on. When I think the the best way to uh, to approach it is to build your VM and don't install anything. Just build the VM that you that the um, with the updates you got everything all set and then. Do a, do a test deployment because then you then you know like look okay I'm on the right track I'm doing this right I didn't I didn't change any settings or it's just prepping correctly everything's fine then start adding software right and just do the basic stuff and um, and and then go from there we and I say that because we have customers that that will say like oh my my image isn't working and and uh, you know, we'll walk through and like, okay, well, it's deploying correctly. It looks like SysPrep is completing correctly, but there's something else going on. And and you have two options. Throw yourself on the rock some more to try and figure out what's happening or just build a new VM. And um, I mean, and I, I don't mean to say that you just have to trash all your work, but it's a virtual machine. Just make another one and then like get go figure out what use that to figure out where it's breaking. What what app did you install? What, what did you do that was breaking it? Now, that is easy to say for a company like, you know, that they're just using, they're using the office suite and they have mm-hmm. a couple apps that they like to use and it's easy to just, boom, you have a new VM up in an hour. But it might take two or three hours. I guess my, my advice is like, don't be afraid to make a new VM. Uh, 
you might end up saving yourself a lot of time. And, uh, you know, and I know that, you know, problems become personal, especially for me. I mean, I've spent stuff like, you know, you feel like it's you versus the computer and you're going to win when if you just like take a break, turn it off, yep. make a new VM, go walk through your steps again, and then you'll just find it magically works. And it took you less time than trying to hammer this thing and trying to get it to work. And, um, and of course, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this again, no one plays upgrades. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what you guys do over there at Smart to Play, but that sounds like that would be a good T-shirt uh, to wear walking around at, say, Ignite or, or something like that. Microsoft might cringe a little bit, but... Um... <laughs> no one plays upgrades. The, our, uh, our other joke of the T-shirt we're going to make just says, pass that word one across the chest. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> our, favorite, our favorite temporary password, pass that word one. Yep, 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 yep. Uh, and that's uh yeah, that's that's the other kind of devil in the detail, right? Is then people get frustrated with their updates, so then they start making easy passwords, especially in smaller shops, and then you expose yourself on security vulnerabilities and all that stuff if you ever actually physically lose the hardware, which does happen quite a bit, surprisingly. Oh yeah, we've run into uh uh we've run into that before. And then of course in consulting work but uh, yep. before I was at Smart Deploy, uh we you know, you do a lot of sandbox work and it's easy to just, I'm just trying to get this to work. I'm going to throw this password in. And then before you know it, you've, you've sent stuff out the door and the, the password that can bring everything coming down is past that word one. Yep. So that's not a good idea. No, it's definitely not. And um, every once in a while you hear about, about admin, admin being left as a router config. And it's like, how did your company get hacked? It's like, well, we were paying $30 million for this great security suite. And then we just didn't change the default password on our new router or new switch that we installed oh. or whatever. Uh, it's making my heart rate great increase. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jeff, why don't we dive into you a little bit here before we jump into quick tips. You know, what's your background? What, what are you doing? What's going on with you? Oh, um, so... How much time do you have? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, it is a family-friendly show. Uh, I've been uh, I've been working for Prowess, the company, our, our parent at Smart Deploy, our parent company is Prowess, and I've worked there since 2004. And so um, I've done a lot of work, and and I I brought up Sandbox because that's where I've mainly worked. Is um, you know with Microsoft is a great example. I've done a ton of work with Microsoft where we come in and a product group says, hey, we're about to launch this new system center um, software that no one's mm -hmm. seen before. And we want a demo and a lab to, to use for training and sales and everything. And they're like, do you know system center? And the, my joke was always not yet. Yeah. <laughs> to dive in and master it and then write documentation and build virtual machine labs in it, or sometimes physical labs to teach other people to, to do that. And, um, in a nutshell, I ended up doing that for 13 years for just different products. And so it's been pretty fun to, um, to, to one, see new technology sure, um, and work with the product groups and, you know, get all insight on what's coming, coming down. But the frustrating part is when you're working in that space, you know, okay, I'm having a problem with service manager. You can't Google uh, mm -hmm. for advice on a product no one's used yet. Like, it's you. And so, but... On the other hand, I did have the opportunity to go, you know, down the hall and be like, "Hey, person who works and helped build this product, I have this problem." <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I did that for uh, 13 years or 14 years, and um, and while I never really felt like I was burning out because I was touching new products and mm -hmm. like you know a year or so or or less and uh, do new stuff, they were. Um, over at Smart Deploy, they thought they they wanted to do this, you know, training video things, and someone must have looked around in the office and said, "Who do we who do we know in the office that uh, likes likes to get that much attention, and who's the loudest?" And I was like, "I'll do it." <laughs> so uh, I actually came back from vacation. Was it last year? Or over over a year ago, I came back from vacation, and uh, they're like, "Okay, welcome back. Here's some video equipment." You're on the hook now, and you're gonna. You don't do that. You're in Smart Deploy now, and go start making videos. <laughs> nice. And so uh, we thought, well, what would help me make videos is I I joined the support team, to um, you know I just got shoulder to shoulder just started taking support tickets like to find sure. out like where pain points and and uh, a funny thing we noticed is you know sure there's there's plenty of 
plenty of hangups and gotchas with using smart deploy specifically, but there were certainly maybe more hurdles and problems that people were running into just with Windows. I mean, and so SysPrep is is a perfect example. Um, sometimes there's all these hurdles. Um, some some examples are. Um, you know, if you have to install these certain patches if you want to use mm -hmm. Windows Windows 7 with an NVMe drive, and so no, you never really think you need to install those on a virtual machine, and um, you know, or or copy profiles not working. Like, why can't I want all my all my users to to have the same profile? Like, how do I use that? This isn't working, and so we thought we can make videos not just with Smart Deploy, but you know, let's let's dive into these hurdles, these pain points for Windows 10. That's a, and and an older versions that are affecting everybody and um yeah so it's been pretty fun it's it's been it's 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 a weird change to go from turning the wrench and digging ditches yeah. and like, late nights to now i'm um, like what do people want to know about and like what can i how can i help like what what annoys me <laughs> like yep. how can i make people avoid being annoyed yeah so it's yeah, been pretty for sure. fun i mean that, that's yeah. interesting the way you bring up that that point because that's Basically, what I do for for Blue Whale Web or the the owning uh, platform of Petri.com, because one of the things we joke about is when people end up on Petri.com, it's not because they're having a good day. It's because they went to Google and <laughs> yeah. said something crashed, something broke, and they've they've come to our site and they're trying to they're trying to get an answer. Like we, we're very aware that people don't go to Petri.com for casual reading on a Sunday afternoon. I mean, it's technical content, um, it's IT pro related content. It, you know, it's very good stuff, but it's not your casual reading. And so that's like for when Microsoft renamed Project Honolulu to Windows Admin Center, it's like, okay, we need to start getting things out there on there. It's like, what are the problems you're going to run into? And then what we do is very similar to like what you just did is we start asking around. It's like, hey, what are the common problems people are running into? That way we can develop content around the scenarios um, to genuinely help people out. And so it, it's you got to start in the trenches uh, just about no matter where mm -hmm. you're going in this industry, it seems. Yeah, I mean, and there's nothing better than like, oh, I'm having a problem. Search, and then the first return, here is your answer, or that. Yep. <laughs> and of course, it's it's also fun to be, to turn around and go, I fixed it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Not random user on the internet forum, but I mean, I think in this industry, this it's like we you can't do this without help from from everybody else, you know, and so. Uh, yeah, I mean, and even better is if there's a video that says, here's how you fix it, and here's why it broke in the first place, don't do that. Or, and here's how the next time you do this, do it X, X Y, Z, whatever. And it is fun to just play with cool video equipment, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it is. It is. Um, I mean, as you can see, I built, this is actually in the basement of my house. Uh, we kind of oh. went all in, and it's like, well, we thought about renting uh, an office and all that, and I was like, you know what? I can just carve out a small area, and we just built a, a studio down here. I've got sure. um, the lighting is probably the the hardest thing to deal with because of things just like you can see a small reflection right up there, and mm -hmm. um, but well, you know what it's like getting lighting and all that. And plus, to your point, who doesn't love playing with fancy video equipment? Yeah, I I uh, commandeered an office and uh, I bought a bunch of the foam foam squares and the yep. green screen, and it definitely helps. But it, it you know I think. We we need to take it to the next level probably and really, really take it up a notch. Yeah, yeah. Video is good though. I mean, that's people. It's easier to watch a video than it is to read a post, especially if they can watch. Okay, it's like, oh, okay, Jeff clicked here and then he drug here, and this is exactly what he entered. Those are that's always super helpful. And yeah. um, speaking of super helpful, what are, what are your quick tips that you're bringing us today, Jeff? Uh, quick tips that you may you may not think about when you're building your reference VM. Um, don't install antivirus on your reference VM. Interesting. Now, that may seem counterintuitive, uh, but um, we find that it is another thing that breaks the, the deployment process in new and interesting ways, and not maybe not just the deployment, but even a capture. We find numerous uh, 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 reference VMs, we can't complete the capture because of something it did to the file system or um, or, or you know, it, it's the, the deployment process and the way the scanning works. It could be flagged as um, uh, it could be flagged as as what's the word? Bad bad activity when it's really not. And even on on having antivirus on your host, we find that sometimes we need to disable it to do this activity. But we um, we always tell people 
you, it's easy to script the installation of your antivirus software as part of the deployment. Um, Smart Deploy has a task tab that um, you can do right in the answer file, and and so and and even better when you want to change or or update your antivirus software, you don't have to open up your VM anyway. So. Uh, we always tell people, leave it off. Leave the antivirus off, script the installation, um, either as part of the deployment or you can use group policy. That's that's just a you know a better way to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, the other is, uh, and this is a strange one, Office 365. Uh, you don't want to, you can have Office 365 on your reference VM that you're going to capture and deploy, but you can't open it. Uh, there's something about Office 365 that doesn't, it doesn't like what happens when the the system is sysprepped. And so, uh, you know, you, you'll deploy your, your machine and Office is broken, it's not doing stuff right or whatever, and then you go back to your VM and like, everything's fine, and so your first instinct is, okay, this deployment software is breaking Office when it's 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 sysprep and, and Office not getting along. Um, it's easy to fix though, you just go back to your reference VM, uninstall Office, re- restart, Reinstall Office. Don't open any of the Word or Excel or anything like that. Shut down. Capture VM. Good to go. Um, what else? The uh, another one. This this is less common, but um, physical physical to virtual conversions. You know, you might you might think you're saving time. You know, oh, it would be great if we had an image of this this physical this server or, or uh, you know this someone has their laptop perfect. Let's let's capture that and then so the you'll do um you'll do a physical to virtual conversion and then you have your virtual disk and try and capture that. One, it may not work. And if it does, it can be problematic down the road because you have all the devices and everything else that came that's related to the physical piece of hardware. And the whole idea, at least with Smart Deploy, is you have a reference VM with none of those drivers. And so you can deploy, your image remains hardware independent. So if you have, you know, uh, if a a laptop, uh, let's say it was Lenovo, and you, you did all that conversion stuff and captured your image and deployed to a different version of Lenovo, you may have headaches with driver problems or things like that. So we always tell people, don't do it. Yeah. I mean, and and personally, I don't I've tried I've tried just to, you know, get rid of this this old server. I've actually tried to do conversions and I've hit headaches just even getting it to a working virtual machine as it is. But uh so yeah, we always tell people to uh, don't don't get cute. It's, you're not you're not doing yourself the favor you think you are. Um, yeah, those are those are probably the three common ones that that I would say. Those are those are. Yeah, but that's tips. I mean that's really solid stuff, especially for somebody um, because we know from analytics that uh, there's a good chunk of the corporate world is on Windows 10, but there's still a lot a, and a lot on Windows 7, and these nobody's you know those groups have definitely not gone through some of this stuff with Windows 10, and so that's uh, oh, yeah. that's a really. It's that, I mean, that's good stuff. There's no other way to describe it. And uh, and for those people, don't don't upgrade seven to ten. Definitely create a new VM. <laughs> yeah, and that. That, <laughs> uh, that's that actually that uh that reminds me of another another problem common problem that um a lot of people don't don't know is um one of, one of the ways that you can do uh, a deployment is to use the adi- existing disk structure. You kind of just uh, not not wipe and load, but uh. So yeah, that is wipe and load. Um, you'll you'll run into weird errors with disk. Um, it'll say the disk doesn't have enough space because the system partition for Windows 7 is smaller than 10, and so that won't work. And often that's that's required for certain certain methods of uh, if you're going to use a user state migration tool to to kind of do a local backup to save files and then load your new image and load those files back on. That won't work if you're going from 7 to 10. You'll have to do a you know. You know, take the user USMT to files to a network location. Very cool, very cool. Well, Jeff, as we end the the podcast here, there's always time for a shameless plug. Where where, oh, where, yeah. you, where are you posting all these videos at? Uh, if for more tech info on you know, it centers a lot around imaging, but you know, we 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 like to do videos on all things tech. You can go to our Smart Deploy channel, youtubecom deploy and. Um, you know we got a you know we're putting videos up there as fast as possible we are we're getting better at it and um, of course if there's something that you'd like to see a video on either imaging or smart deploy or whatever let us know and you know we'll add it to the video queue I like to make like to make videos very cool well we sincerely appreciate your time I mean there's a lot of good stuff in there and I know definitely some people are gonna find some value out of those tips and tricks uh, I hope as so. everyone tries to navigate through <laughs> all of this stuff 
And uh, Jeff, if people have further questions or whatever, uh, what's the best way to reach out to you? Well, you know, you can, um, the, well, if, I mean, if you're a Smart Deploy customer, you know, please reach out to Smart Deploy Support. I'm happy to help you there. And, um, you know, you can, re I would say we're on Twitter. You can hit us up on Twitter and, uh, and of course, through our YouTube channel. Uh, please, please do. We'd love to hear from you. Very cool. Well, that wraps it up for today, folks. This has been another episode of the Enterprise Dish. Uh, make sure you hit that like and subscribe button down below, and we're going to catch you right back here next time, and hopefully you uh, got as much out of this as I did. See you later.